Hi, I'm Dan Curtis with Nomad Capitalist. Today we're speaking with Peter Bukvar. Peter is the Chief Investment Officer of the Bleakley Group Financial Group. He's also the editor of the book report. Welcome, Peter. Thanks for having me. You know, Peter, you do a great job of tracking and plotting macro trends across the global economy. What do you see as being kind of the global headlines for 2022? Well, it's clearly high inflation and the, the central bank response to that. Uh, where inflation is running at 40-year highs and interest rates are rising at the quickest pace since then as well. Uh, central banks were very, well, first of all, they stoked the inflation that we're currently experiencing, and then were very late to acknowledge it and thus respond to it. So it's both the economic impact of uh, the higher cost of doing business, the higher cost of living, but also now combining that with the higher cost of capital which directs, directly uh, influences, of course, the uh, big ticket purchases that households make that have to borrow money. And of course, uh, businesses that have borrowed floating rate or need to borrow for uh, staying uh, in business or expanding or whatever, uh, they're having to pay uh, a higher price for that. So yeah, I mean, obviously housing sales are down. Uh, obviously interest, interest rates are up. Uh, do you see a bottom? To this, do you see a, a you know a, the the bottom of the curve? Well, when you say bottom, I mean I, you mean a, more of a top in rates. I, well, um, yes, yeah. I, I, yeah. Uh, where, where our economy, where housing starts to rise and interest rates start to fall. Well, I I, I think the, the you look at the U.S. yield curve. I think the Fed, after a uh, seventy five basis point hike at the November meeting, likely followed by fifty in December. I'm of the opinion that'll be it. But even if it's another 25 basis points after that, we're, we're pretty much, I believe, have priced in peak Fed hawkishness. So short-term interest rates, I would argue, yes, have probably seen uh, most of the rise. Longer-term interest rates, particularly the 10-year where mortgage rates are priced off, fixed rate mortgages are priced off, I think that's still way too early to call a top in yields. I think there's, I can make the argument that the U.S. 10-year is going to go to 5%, and I can make the argument that it's going to go to 35 It would go to 35 if the market just focuses on uh, slowing U.S. growth and moderating inflation. It can go to 5% if inflation still remains sticky, but also if there are further accidents in global bond markets. And I say further because we already got a taste of one in the U.K. in late September. I think you still have the possibility for one in Europe, as the ECB catches up with their rate hikes and debates quantitative tightening. And of course, it could happen in the US as the, as the Fed gets deeper into QT at the same time that foreigners buy less treasuries and banks also uh, purchase less treasuries. That there's still a lot of space for accidents that, um, again, makes the long end of the yield curve more difficult to call relative to the shorter end. Yeah, and it certainly is a global perspective. Uh, do you are you seeing any type of global safe haven even left? Well, now you can argue that uh, if I'm right with the Fed, that short-term Treasuries can be uh, a safe haven in nominal terms. Of course, even getting a four percent yield, four and a half percent yield, is still below the rate of inflation, so you'll lose money on real terms. That's really, to me, the only safe haven, as it's still a uh, a, a risk-free instrument if you hold it to maturity. Now, there are other, no, no such thing as risk-free, but there are lower risk things that I think are out there, particularly after the sell-off that we've seen, since bear markets do present better buying opportunities. Um, but there's no such thing as, as risk-free other than you know short-term treasuries. How do gold and commodities, how do they fit into that picture? Well, I, I am I have been bullish and we're long uh, commodity stocks, particularly energy and precious metals. Uh, energy, of course, has been a, a great performer this year, and I think it will continue to be uh, into 2023 and even maybe into 2024. Precious metals have outperformed stocks this year, but where I should say gold has, silver has uh, been you know, obviously a leverage play on gold, so it's done worse. And it's been disappointing over the last couple of years, but I'm still a believer in holding it as an asset. I still believe that uh, real rates will remain uh, very negative, and uh, I still believe that central banks are not going to be able to craft a soft landing here that um, once they 
end their rate hiking cycle, uh, which I think, like I said, we're near with the Fed and some other central banks are already getting weak knees with their rate hiking, particularly the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Bank of Canada, and even the ECB, which after hiking 75, you've already had rumblings that they that may not continue at that pace. So I think that the attention is going to shift more towards the economic impact of these rate increases and less so inflation, and that would be bullish for gold, and that would probably result in the dollar peaking out, which has been on an amazing ride this year higher. So uh, U.S. obviously in a recession, uh, whether they admit it or not. Uh, well, yeah, statistically, it's not so obvious, but I think definitely parts of the U.S. economy are clearly in one. Uh, housing's in a recession. The low-income consumers are probably in their own personal recession as wages are rising less than, than inflation. Uh, manufacturing is essentially on the cusp of one. If you look at the ISM survey, but if you look at the regional manufacturing indices, they're all in contraction. Uh, and But I think the trajectory is for 2022, GDP on real terms at the end of the fourth quarter will likely end below where it ended the fourth quarter of 2021. How does that compare to what's happening in Europe? Because they're obviously dealing with their own recessionary, uh, you know, kind of um, situation. Well, amazingly, the European uh, economy eked out a, 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 a tiny gain in the third quarter as uh, tourism was a major boost as um, people sort of reopened their lives in full, uh, offset by the pain of higher energy prices and what that means for the manufacturing sector. But um, particularly in the fourth quarter and into the first quarter of next year, uh, Europe is certainly going to have a diff difficult time growing. And if you look at Asia, uh, we, we know that the, the Chinese have, have um, inflicted major uh, wounds on themselves versus, uh, via their their zero COVID policy and um, and the sort of distress in the residential real estate market. How do you feel about uh, either one of these economies pulling out of it? Uh, what needs to happen? Well, it's easy for the Chinese. Well, not so easy, but somewhat easy. Uh, they just have to reopen. They just have to get off the zero COVID approach and the, the Chinese economy will have a fighting chance. Uh, the real estate market will still see further distress. COVID, no COVID or COVID regardless. Um, the, the rest of Asia will obviously feel the impact of, of, of whatever China does. And uh, you know, maybe some, some cooling down of the, of the China-Taiwan rhetoric would also help too, but that remains to be seen. With respect to Europe, you know, not only do they have to get through the winter without any um, weather an, uh, accidents that would influence the price of natural gas, uh, there has to be a plan for the following winter in, in refilling. It was, it was somewhat easier to refill this year, their storage of tanks uh, with natural gas, but next winter is going to be more difficult. But overall, I think the world's going to have to deal with this higher cost of capital, this higher level of inflation that is going to take time to adjust to, but the end result is going to be slower economic growth just generally. I understand. Uh, I, I don't know how much you touch on this in your, in your book report, but how... How do the elections first in Italy and then obviously more recently in Brazil, how do those affect the, the global economy? How, do, how does that affect your macro? Very little. I mean, I think Italy's had 70 different governments since World War II. So making investment decisions on Italian politics, you're going to be uh, moving around your portfolio a lot. Uh, I think the, the Brazilian election, you know, Brazil is always the, the country that they say has all the potential that never realizes it. And uh, I think this will just be another example of that. Um, so I, I, it's not really influencing my my uh, decisions too much, okay. those, those specifically. Uh, and the last question, it's kind of a prediction question. Uh, how do you see the rest of this year and the beginning of next year playing out just on a global level? Well, it's going to be tough to call what's going to happen in the next two months. You know, then you have uh, on one hand, a lot of seasonal influences and uh, We'll, we'll see what happens with the with the U.S. elections, uh, but in the other and and maybe some hints from the Fed that uh, that the pace of increases will will moderate. But on the other hand, dealing with just the repercussions of all these rate increases and a, a slowing economy and and a slowing earnings story that I think is going to take on greater relevance in uh, in 2023. So um, it's going to be 
continued challenge in the investment world uh, that I think that we're just have to going to have to deal with and continue to grind through as we get into next year. Peter, where can we find you um, if we wanted to learn more? So um, the, the main job is CIO of Bleakly uh, Financial Group, and you can learn about us at Bleakly.com. It's a wealth management firm. And if you want to read my daily commentary and market missives, it, it's uh, go to bookreport.com. That's B O O C K report.com, and you can trial it. And if you like it, you can subscribe. I've been reading it uh, religiously. It's uh, incredibly comprehensive. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's uh, almost, um, yeah, scary how much information you pack into each individual day. So, uh, thank yeah. you. Appreciate thank that. You on that. Uh, that's, that's what I had. I appreciate your time, Peter. Uh, I know our viewers will feel the same. Yeah, I appreciate having me on. Thanks very much.